Today is Sunday the 14th of June 2009 and my name is Philip Snow and I am uh, continuing with a series of videos in which I'm seeking to uh, explain uh, my understanding of what's uh, going on in the world today, especially the bigger picture of what's going on in the world today and what kind of changes we might expect over the next uh, few years and also to, to track the changes as they happen. And at this early stage in the series, I feel it's important to explain who I am and why it is that I uh, believe the things that I'm saying, what my background is, how I came to understand these things. And um, I really need to go back, really, over the course of my life, because it all started uh, 50 years ago when I was 12 years old, and I'm 63 now. Um, when I felt that I could see in society that things really weren't working in quite the way that they ought to be by my judgment uh, where people didn't seem to care enough about other people I'm not talking about friends and family I'm talking about the whole of society and uh, there was clearly an overall objective to um, encourage everyone to be successful in uh, a material sense, perhaps an economic sense. Uh, the children of my age were encouraged to uh, pass exams and get the highest marks and so on. And in England there's always been a class structure uh, where people of so-called different classes are treated differently. And I felt there was something wrong about that. I felt that uh, people ought to care about everyone uh, and uh, help each, each other. And I didn't really know what I was looking at at that time, but I said to myself, and I, I, I distinctly remember the, the moment I said it to myself, that I was going to spend the rest of my life sorting this out. Now that was, that was quite an ambition for a 12-year-old, uh, and it is taking the rest of my life to sort it out. Um, but like all teenagers, I got on with my life and, um, and eventually started developing a career which was uh, in hotel management. And that was fairly typical for me because it meant that I could do things for people, I could help people, I could serve people, I could give people a, a nice experience. And that was the kind of thing that I wanted to do, the kind of thing that I enjoyed doing. And it was during the early years, actually, of my training uh, in Scotland at uh, hotel school, where uh, I saw uh, an American magazine, a big glossy affair called, I think it was Time Life, or it might have been Life magazine, and they were talking about, there was an article about existentialism, and I thought it all sounded very high-flung uh, and complicated, and I, I wrote a letter to the, to the editor. Uh, giving my understanding of existentialism. Quite frankly, I don't really understand existentialism today. But the letter sounded good because I had a, a, a bit of a talent for, for writing well. And a couple of months later, this letter was uh, published in the, in the magazine as the lead letter. And I thought, how ridiculous. How ridiculous that a letter from a, an 18-year-old who really didn't know what he was talking about, but just sounded good. Uh, would be recognized as, as something worth printing. And it was the beginning of a time when I really did develop um, a fairly healthy cynicism about uh, so-called authorities, people who were in power or who had influence, and questioned whether people like that really uh, do know what they're talking about, you know, really do have uh, a good uh, perspective on the way that things really ought to be, or whether they're doing it more for their own interests, or just going along with some overall aim of society, whoever it is who influences and directs society, uh, and whether any of this was really in people's best interest. I know that you know most of these people are good people. Uh, and they do what they believe is the right thing, and they, many of them have a, uh, an attitude of 
service to the public, and all that's fine. Uh, but is there behind all this some, some greater influence that determines how the whole of society goes? And I've been looking at this for many, many, many years now, and seen other instances <coughs> where it looks as though the way that things are being done is not really uh, according to some universal principle of some sort, not done on the basis of caring about people, on the basis of love for everyone, uh, which of course is the, the underlying principle of many religions, especially the Christian religion that I was brought up in. But even that when I was a teenager made me feel that uh, although the preachers preached, I wasn't getting the experience and I wasn't seeing that the experience of love in society was really uh, was really there. So I've been looking at this for a long time. And I had an experience in the 1970s when I was running my own hotel business in Edinburgh. And things weren't going well. And I felt that I needed to, to find out how how I could make decisions that were going to be the right decisions to make, whether there was some sort of universal principle or guideline about how to make decisions. And I felt that most people would say that, well, you have to go through the mill and make all the wrong decisions, and you just learn through experience what kind of decisions might be right. And fair enough, I thought, but I thought there must be some, some other, some way of aligning oneself to some sort of universal uh, being where spontaneously you would do what was right. And it was about that time that I met someone who was practicing transcendental meditation. And this was new to me, and I asked him what it was all about. And he said, oh, it's about achieving your full potential, who you really are. Well, that, that thing about who you really are was something that had only recently, before that time, occurred to me. I thought, I need to be who I really am. I need to find out who I, who I really am and do what, I'm, what is really right for me to do. And so I learned this transcendental meditation, and I got very involved in it. And I began to see that they were talking about how to uh, live according to what they called spontaneous right action and alliance with natural law. So this alignment with some sort of universal principle. And they were setting up a community in Skelmersdale in northwest England uh, for people who were doing an advanced form of meditation called yogic flying. Uh, the idea being that practicing as a group of yogic flyers would, in their words, raise the collective consciousness of the whole nation. Well, that didn't mean much to me at the time. Uh, but I began to see that what they were talking about was when, when people uh, meditated at a very deep level, at this level of universal being of some sort, that in a very spontaneous kind of way they would uh, live in a right kind of way, in a way that was harmonious, in a way that took account of everything else and everyone else. And we used to have uh, large courses, weekend courses mainly, where we might have seven or eight hundred people attending. And eight hundred people was the number that we always wanted to achieve because it was reckoned by some sort of universal principle which can be described in physics in the same way as laser light is very powerful compared to ordinary light bulbs. Having 800 people meditating together uh, would have a very, very powerful effect on the whole of the collective consciousness of the United Kingdom. And, in fact, we, we found out through doing statistical analysis, and this was being done worldwide at the time, that actually this is, this is what happened, that when we had groups large enough, uh, all meditating together using this advanced a uh, very powerful yogic flying technique that, uh, for example, the politicians or heads of state would be saying very positive, very enlightened things. 